Hi, my name is John Gibbons, and in this talk, I'm going to discuss hip joint pathology and the relationship to the psoas and the gluteal muscles. If you have time, you might want to watch my hip joint pathology video because this is like the next stage from um, that original discussion. So if you've got any hip joint pathology, and that could be osteoarthritis, it could be a labral tear, you could have an FAI, which is a femoral acetabular impingement, which is a, a cam and pincer type. You might have anything. You might have a, a perfess disease. So any problem within the hip joint is naturally going to affect the musculature around it. Like many people say to me, John, I can't get my glutes to work. And I'm saying, has anybody had a look at your hip? No, but I've been trying to do my lunges and squats, but it's not really working and I've got the tightest hip flexors. Why would that be? And I'm saying, well, maybe the hip flexor, like the psoas or the rec fem, is protecting something, i.e. the hip joint, but as a consequence, the psoas is then causing an inhibition into the gluteus, and the gluteus is not working so well, so now the hamstrings is working too hard, or the lower back is working in the role of the weak glutes. But remember, the cause could be a pathology within the hip, but the consequence or the symptoms is my knee hurts or my back hurts or my hip hurts. Okay, so just bear that in mind. So the muscle we are going to discuss will be the iliopsoas, which is naturally the iliacus or iliacus along here from the iliac fossa, comes down to the lesser trochanter. And also we've got the psoas, okay? Psoas major and psoas minor. And then psoas major yeah, will be from uh, L2, 3, 4, and 5, whereas psoas minor will be from T12 and around L1, which goes to the pectineal line in here. So this is the majority of the psoas major that comes down. So let's focus a bit about more on the psoas. So I call the psoas a reactive muscle. So I say it reacts and it protects the hip and spine by contracting. So if you have a problem with your hip joint, the psoas says, oh, I'm not sure if I like it, I'm going to protect you. My lower back hurts, and the psoas says, oh, I'm not sure if I like that, I'm going to protect you. So the psoas tightens as a result of maybe disc pathology, yeah, or maybe hip pathology around you. But either way, the psoas is protecting. So if you stretch your psoas often, you might find nothing works. Why? Because it's trying to protect the structure it's designed to, to move and it moves the hip, and it moves your spine. So if you've got problems with these two, then the psoas says, I don't want you to move that much. So be careful when you try to stretch it too much. The problem is now that underneath this, the muscles, you've got other structures, which are the ligaments. So there's a ligament, one of the strongest we've got, called the iliofemoral, an inverted Y here. We've also got other ligaments, along here, pubofemoral, and one at the back called the ischiofemoral. This is the lesser trochanter, the LT. The GT is the greater trochanter. AIS, anterior inferior iliac spine, anterior superior iliac spine, where the rectus femoris here, and the, um, the sartorius attaches here, okay? And then we've got the bursa that sits, the iliopectineal bursa. So you've got a problem with the ligaments, then again, the psoas is involved, yeah, the back is involved. So just, just bear that in mind. The thing is now, if you've got anything wrong anteriorly, it can now affect the muscle posteriorly. So you've got the agonist and the antagonist. So in this case, we've got the gluteus maximus here. I did write a book called The Vital Glutes. So if you are interested in reading a bit more yeah, about how it works, yeah, what makes it work and things like that, then feel free to, to have a read. Yeah, it's simply called The Vital Glutes and you can buy it on my website or Amazon. Um, now, if you've got a problem with your glutes, have a look at this. This is what they call the normal firing sequence. This, imagine a patient is laying down and, and you ask them to lift their right leg, okay, an inch or two off the couch. The ideal sequence will be either the hamstring, the glutes, or the glutes and the hamstring. So this is one, two, or one, two here. Then it goes to the contralateral erector, then it goes to the ipsilateral erector, which is on the same side. Then it goes to contralateral forical lumbar, then ipsilateral forical lumbar. Okay, so that'll be the six cylinder German car firing sequence, and it should fire in that order. If you change around the leads or the engine, it will misfire, okay, which is what we're gonna look at now. So this would be the normal sequence.
So either the glute works, yeah, number one, or the hamstring works, so they can actually swap roles in here. But have a look at this picture. So this is misfiring sequence number one. So I'm only gonna do four, there's no point in discussing the thoracolumbar area. If one, two, three, four is off, five and six is off. So in this case now, when a patient lifts their leg, number one is a hamstring, which does all the work, then it goes straight to the lower back, then it goes to the opposite side, then eventually gets to the glutes. So the G max is last. So that is now inhibited. Why? Maybe because of what we've already discussed. Maybe the hip flexor is too short, too tight. Yeah, because it's protecting the label tear or it's protecting a degenerative hip joint. But now you might find the hamstring works too hard and now they become dominant and you get recurrent hamstring strains. Look at this one. So this is sequence number two. So now number one is the lower back. So number one does all the work. Then it goes to the hamstring, then the opposite side of the lower back, then the gluteus maximus. But again, glute max is number four. But in this case, now you're walking, you're running, and then the back hurts. Why? Because it's lifting your leg. Why? Because the glute is not working as well as you should. Why? Because of the psoas. Why? Because of the hip, and it's protecting all that. You might find patient has pain in the central buttock. Look at anatomy here. You've got the piriformis muscle, the G med, gluteus medius, G max, gluteus maximus, the sciatic nerve, which comes from L4, 5, S1, 2, and 3, comes here, comes out through a space called the greater sciatic foramen in here, and it's on most population it goes under the piriformis, yeah, it comes underneath it here. But you might find if glute max is not working, piriformis is also reactive to a weak gluteus maximus. So is the problem coming from a hip, but the person comes in with central buttock pain? So again, don't naturally presume you've got a piriformis syndrome um, if you've got pain within that area. It could well be, but it's compensating for a weak glute because it's inhibited by the tight psoas. The problem we've got now, look at the, look at the picture here. Oh, let's go back one. Look at how healthy these discs are. So you've got 23 of these intervertebral discs. Yeah, no problems yeah, within that area. Everyone looks pretty good. So we've got the nu nucleus in the center, and then these circles are called the lamella and they are held in place, okay? Well, it keeps the nucleus in place. You've got about 15 to 25 of these rings. These are the concentric rings of the annulus in here. No problems. Look at this one, off. okay? So the water-based, the nucleus, has now migrated through the annulus, and is now, this is, this is touching the spinal cord, or if it's in lumbar, it'll be the cord equina. Uh, but the nerve root where it comes out, naturally is gonna give you some pain wherever that nerve is going to. So if that's in your neck, it's gonna give you arm pain. Okay, if it's in the lumbar, it's gonna give you sciatic type of symptoms along here. But then you're gonna say, well, why would that be? Look at this, look at the little changes around you. This is called degenerative disc disease, where the vertebra is, where the height is reducing, where the disc is deteriorating, and then these little bony spurs, the osteophytes, are increasing, and it's called now, it's an OA, an osteoarthritis, but it's called a spondylosis around you. You might also find that the facet joints are also compressed, as we'll find shortly. But if you have a tight psoas, many years ago in the 1970s, I saw to Vladimir Yanda, Janda, said he was famous for the lower, he actually has an upper cross syndrome as well. We have an anterior pelvic tilt. And it could well be that certain muscles, the psoas, the erector spinae, is held in a shortened position. And then as a result, the gluteus and the erector, not erector, the um, uh, rectus abdominis, I meant to say, yeah, is in a lengthened position. And because of that increased change, so the psoas is shortened, why? Because it's protecting the hip, why? Because you've got changes within the hip joint. As a consequence, you might find this happens. And now, before you know it, you've got pain to your lower back because you're hyperlordotic, you've got an anterior tilt, and the facet joints are now compressed and they give you pain. And eventually, they become spondy, they have spondylosis. Okay, so they're not open or closed, okay, which is what we call a neutral position of the spine. The facets are forced into extension, so now they are closed, okay, so they force close and they become hyper irritable, yeah, within that sort of area. Now, a couple more things. If the hamstring is pretty tight, for instance, the hamstring attaches on this corner here, there is a ligament called the sacrotubus ligament, which comes on from the ILA, from initial tuberosity. And if a hamstring is pretty tight, you have a bicep femoris, 
along here where it attaches to, it's going to prevent the sacrum from performing its function. So when you are walking and running, the sacrum should be able to rotate on an axis. And if the hamstring is holding the sacrum, it's not going to rotate, which means that L5S1 is going to be compromised. Have a look at uh, this picture, okay, in here. So this right leg is anterior, this left leg is posterior, or the innominates, okay? The right leg is in stance phase of walking, this is in swing phase, so we have this rotation motion here. And then the sacrum should be rotating, in this case, to the right, and the lumbar should be rotating to the left. But if that's not happening, it could well be because the hamstring is preventing the sacrum, yeah, which is causing the L5 to become irritated, and then that L5S1 disc. So already, Think about, we talked about the hip, and we talked about the labeled tear, not in depth, we just mentioned it. We talked about degenerative changes, and then how it results to a protection of the psoas. Then the psoas becomes tight, and it now causes an inhibition into the glutes. Now the glutes don't work very well, and the hamstrings now become very dominant. The hamstrings become very dominant, and it could cause a accumulative effect to the lumbar spine. Yeah? Or even if the glute is not working, when you weight bear on the leg, it can't stabilize the leg so well, so the knee has a tendency to drift inwards. So you might find as a result, you get knee pain. So what I'm just trying to say is, is just bear in mind that any problem within the hip could have a cumulative effect of the psoas, which then causes an inhibition weakness to the other muscles, which, and they all have to work in harmony to provide normal locomotion. Yeah, to be able to walk from A to B without any pain. So just bear that in mind, next time you are treating someone with lower back pain, yeah, or knee pain, or central buttock pain, or groin pain, maybe just have a look at the hips to make sure they are not involved. Because if they are, the focus should be on trying to ascertain the problem yeah, before you just treat the symptoms. I hope you enjoyed the talk. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Uh, the details are uh, on, on, on YouTube. So um, you can leave any comments you feel appropriate. Thank you.